Hi, I am Marlene Peralta. Science and You starts now. I'm Mike Gilliam. Cyber hacktivists try to shut down the Bank of America and PayPal websites, then target Warner Brothers to make a point. So how big is the problem and who's trying to stop them? We'll tell you coming up on Science and You. Is it possible to reproduce me in 3D? Yes, it is. Ahead on Science and You. Hi, I'm Erna Bell DeMillo. So if you have an iPad or a smartphone, you're probably addicted to Angry Birds, like me. But what if I told you that while playing the game, you can learn a thing or two about physics? I'll have that story coming up on Science and You. This tiny chip can help you track down a missing pet. I'm Grant Greenberg, and that's ahead on Science and You. Hi, I am Marlene Peralta. If you cannot live without using your smartphone, checking Facebook, or surfing the web, you might have an addiction problem. I'll bring you the story ahead on Science and You. I'm Barry Mitchell in Times Square. His father was a gambler and bookie who knew hustlers and prize fighters. He grew up to be a respected rocket scientist who knew Albert Einstein. We'll talk with Ronald Probstein about his memoir, Honest Sid, coming up on Science and You. Computer hacking and cybercrime are continuing to evolve. No longer are the greatest dangers posed by the lone wolf sitting at a computer terminal in his bedroom. Now, large organizations are involved. But in rooms like this one at John Jay College, students are being trained to get out there and stamp out big time crime on the internet. It's very, very difficult to uh, defend against these sort of attacks. Doug Salane is an associate professor at John Jay College for Criminal Justice's Center for Cybercrime Studies, where he studied the problem. A very, very large problem. And I think that's evidenced by the uh, tremendous emphasis now in Washington on protecting national cyber infrastructures. Um, you know, what we see now are basically the uh, uh, Congress getting the very serious about uh, developing capability so that they can address massive cyber attacks. Cyber hacking hijacked the headlines recently, in large part due to the antics of a so-called internet hacktivist group called Anonymous. The group came to the defense of WikiLeaks when they targeted the Swiss bank that froze WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange's assets and PayPal, which cut off the WikiLeaks account used for collecting donations. Anonymous launched Operation Payback, a distributed denial-of-services attack designed to shut down the Swiss bank and PayPal's websites. If someone has access to a botnet, which is a number of computers that can work together to do some task on the Internet, um, they can use that to defect a, effect a denial-of-service attack very easily. Selene says the botnet is formed when computers are controlled after being infected with malware, which can easily occur when one simply surfs the web and clicks on infected links. Botnets and Trojans can be huge. He says it's estimated the Zeus Trojan is now on more than three and a half million computers in the U.S. alone. We see the rise of this uh, advanced uh, persistent threat on the internet where someone who really wants to go and get something will put a lot of resources into it and continue attacking until they actually accomplish their goal. That's a change. In the past, the mob or small-time hackers went after what the experts called the low-hanging fruit, easily accessible passwords and bank accounts. And if they ran into a roadblock, they just moved on to the next mark. Selene says not so with the persistent threat. Some well-financed group uh, wants to bring down a service or wants to get some intellectual property or wants to get into a sensitive government computer. They're going to keep at it and keep throwing resources at the problem. How do you prevent that sort of thing? Uh, I think that's what people are wrestling with right now. I, I, I think people feel we just don't have good mechanisms to present, prevent that. Now, 
I want to introduce you to Bilal Khan. He's the expert here at John Jay. He deals a lot with computer security. Bilal, what are some of the things that you guys are doing to try to stop down this problem? Okay, so um, the courses that I teach at John Jay have to do with operating systems and networking. It's really not uh, so much as um, teaching them how to defend as it is teaching them how the actual system works so they can understand the mechanics of the attack so they can come up with new ways to defend um, the system because they can see the attacks before they happen. Khan says the methods of attack are changing so fast that just teaching students to defend would make them obsolete before they even get out into the real world. What I would like to provide the students here is an, an, uh, a vision of what's causing the security problem in the first place by going deep into the, uh, into the heart of the matter so that they can be in a position to develop new security solutions as the problems become apparent down the road without having to play sort of this continuous chase game. But the attacks continue. In March, Anonymous and Operation Payback went after the recording industry when they sued shareware site LimeWire for $75 trillion. That's more money than the recording industry has made in its history. And the suit is over the sharing of music files on the Internet. They also attacked Warner Brothers and other parties to the lawsuit. And that goes right to the heart of the problem, the Internet and money. Our payment system increasingly is becoming dependent upon a working Internet. And so uh, I think now it's felt basically that the usual methods of organization of the Internet and the methods of protecting it are no longer adequate. Students from John Jay's computer and network security programs go on to work for big banks, large corporations, and the government as they continue to battle cyber crime on the front lines. I'm Mike Gilliam for Science and You. I'm Lisa Beth Kovitz for Science and You. What if you could print out chess pieces and chocolate candies and doorknobs just at the press of a button? 3D printing is taking on these tasks and more. The advent of print-ready plastics has made 3D printing a reality. MakerBot is a Brooklyn-based company deep into the desktop printing revolution. We came for a visit, and while we were there, we printed out my face. This is Jonathan Monahan, artist in residence at MakerBot Industry. How close are we to Star Trek? We are already there. With a, with a 3D printer and a MakerBot, you have the replicator from Star Trek. So we live in the future here at MakerBot Industries. So right now, your head is opened up in an open source software called Replicator G. And Replicator G will turn your head into G-code. And G-code tells the maker about what to do. It tells it how to move all the motors and where to place all the plastic. Where do people find these images? Well, all of our models are online at Thingiverse. So you could go to Thingiverse and download 10,000 really cool objects and your head will be on there. The thing about a 3D printer that is really special is it makes what you want. And we're so used to living a consumerist lifestyle that when we want things, we just, you know, go to Amazon or we go to the store and we just buy it, you know. But that makes us limited in what we can actually get. When you have a MakerBot and you want something, you think, okay, you know, can I make it? It puts an interrupt switch in that space between wanting something and buying it. The interesting thing is this is happening. You know, when we started out, we started in the first month we sold 20 machines. And now we sell hundreds of machines a month. And bit by bit, people are, are more and more people are, are learning how to live a MakerBot lifestyle where you make things instead of buying them. But what if you don't have a 3D printer? What Shapeways is doing is bringing this high-end technology and with smart applications we're making this accessible for everyone. You can now use machines that in the past were only accessible to large corporates, aircraft and automobile industry companies. This idea that you can make anything you want Mm -hmm. That's huge. It's, it's such a small sentence, but such a big idea. It's basically the same principle that you're used to when you type something up in your favorite word processor and you send it off to your printer. I mean, the first time that I saw that, I was also a little bit mesmerized that you can type something in a computer and then you can hold it in your hands, right? But now you don't do this with text on a piece of paper, you do this with a real object. You can actually make uh, functional pieces, things that move, that have, that, um, like gears indeed. Um, and this is uh, what they call a strand-based, which we translate into English as uh, beach animal. It has 70 seven zero moving parts, 
And this is printed directly from a digital description into a machine, directly coming out of the machine like this. This is amazing. 3D printing, really, the only limitation is your own imagination. I mean, what people come up with, they can make. That's, that's really great. Yes, yeah, so you push the edge of technology, you be absurd, interesting things will happen, and you'll, you'll learn. Terrific. From MakerBot in Brooklyn, New York, this has been Lisa Beth Kovitz for Science and You. Hi, I'm Ernabelle DeMillo. Imagine you're in high school and your teacher tells you that you're going to be playing Angry Birds today. Well, here at John Jay High School in Cross River, New York, it's all part of today's lesson. Does this music sound familiar? Does it make you think of flying birds crashing down on pigs? Angry Birds is one of today's most popular video games, but these students aren't playing around, they're studying. When it comes to what the velocities look like, well, we average the x velocities before. When you average the upper blue bird and the lower blue bird, it all averages out. They're studying the laws of physics. How does that make sense? It should be the opposite. X should go up a little bit. Their teacher, Frank Noskesi, came up with the idea of using Angry Birds in the classroom when he saw the kids playing the game. We've already done lab activities and discussions about laws of physics, and now what Angry Birds does, or video games in general, it presents us with a brand new world where the kids can go and investigate what laws of physics hold in that world. You heard him right. His students are studying physics in the Angry Bird world, where bluebirds split in three and funny-looking white birds drop their eggs, all in an effort to defeat the pigs. What I want you to do is to use the screen test to investigate the different laws of physics in Angry Birds world. Are they the same? Are they different? Do the Angry Birds follow the same rules of projectile motion that we normally associate with throwing basketballs and footballs and, and such? We were all really, really excited because like, we don't normally get to do this stuff. Like, so this is why like, we all love physics so much. And this is, Physics C is like our second year of physics. So we, we really like what we do in physics and what we get to like, learn about like, the things around us. So it's really cool. The students use a computer program to record a video of the trajectory of the birds, and then they analyze it. They pick a question, design an experiment, and come up with a conclusion. The question that my team was um, investigating was whether or not the bluebirds, when they split in three, can serve momentum. Has it made you a better Angry Birds player? Um, I still kind of shoot them randomly when I have no idea what I'm doing. So, not really, not yet. But when it comes to physics, Melissa knows exactly what she's doing. My main goal is to show the kids that physics is all around us and that they can do physics. They don't have to be a rocket science to do physics. So for you addicted to Angry Birds, are you wondering if the Blue Birds conserve their momentum when they split in three? Over here, are there three different X velocities going like this and then this and this. It's a dark green, a kind of pale green and an orange. We averaged the X velocities and found that the trajectory is similar. Hmm, I think I need a refresher course in physics. So according to the makers of Angry Birds, more than 200 million apps have been downloaded. So that's about 200 million people who are getting a lesson in physics. I'm Ernabel DeMillo in Cross River, New York for Science and You. I'm Grant Greenberg for Science and You. Let's say your pet is missing and his collar falls off. Well, now simple technology can help you get him back. Stats show one in every three family pets will at some point get lost. A hard fact not lost on Norman Mohi. Mohi, a software entrepreneur, is a former aerospace engineer whose company is developing a way to track a lost dog through GPS technology. He calls it Search, spelled with a C. Search essentially is a software download on the three major um, wireless platforms such as iPhone, Android, and Blackberry. Its purpose is to allow mobile-to-mobile -mobile tracking between those devices. When a small pager is fitted to the dog's collar, Moe's software can track it well beyond a simple dot on a map. A traditional dot on a map may not be very, very helpful in finding them. What Search does that is different is that in addition to the dot on the map, it has a patented feature that points in the direction of the person or in this case being a pet that you're looking for relative to where you are and where you're facing and headed. Like a compass pointing north, the arrow on display points directly to your lost dog and measures an exact distance right over your phone. 
search as a technology will allow you to find anyone or anything, including pets, very easily, accurately. While search is now undergoing field tests, a proven way to recover your lost pet is presently available at your local vet. What we're going to do is we're going to inject this little microchip that's about the size of a piece of rice under the skin in between her shoulder blades. And hopefully we're going to do that without her noticing. So we'll see how this goes. All right. Ready, sweetie? Oh, she's so brave. Little poke. What was that? What was that? That was it. It takes a second and a half. It's in already. A second and a half is all it takes to ensure your pet comes back home. We visited the Somerset Veterinary Group in East Bridgewater, New Jersey to get a closer look. Basically, a microchip is not that much different than getting a routine vaccine. It's, uh, you know, the needle's a little bit bigger, but not much, and really they don't mind very much getting chipped. Six to eight million pets a year enter U.S. shelters. Many are lost family dogs or cats who ran off or just got lost. But they can be happily reunited with their families through the science of microchip technology. Linda Block is with Home Again, a pet recovery service who believes the most important gift you can give your pet is a microchip. It utilizes RFID technology, radio frequency identification. So basically just a radio wave comes out of a reader and picks up a unique identifier in the microchip. A scanner like this one will indicate the presence of the chip containing your personal identification code as registered in the database of the recovery service. In the database at a pet recovery service like Home Again, that's where you would put your contact information, your sister's contact information, your mother's contact information, a photo, medical information, behavior information that you would want whoever's finding your pet to know to be able to take care of your pet. So that if your dog gets lost, any vet, animal control, shelter can help find you and reunite you with your pet. Getting your pet chipped is smart and easy on your budget. It's not painful, requires no anesthesia or surgery, there's no hospital stay, there are no batteries, it doesn't move around, and it's permanent. The average cost of implanting a microchip by a veterinarian is approximately $40, $45. Included in that is the registration of the microchip, and then there's an annual fee of $16.99. When you register a microchip, you're, you get lifetime registration in our database. Every dog, every pet should be chipped. A tiny chip or satellite tracking. Either way, we can have our pets where they belong, with us. I'm Grant Greenberg for Science and You. I am Marlene Peralta. Even though addiction to technology is not yet a recognized psychological condition by doctors, many studies suggest that its effects are similar to that of a drug addict. If a person cannot say goodbye to their controller or their phone or their iPad or turn the computer off for one to two hours a night, then I think you really have to ask yourself, what's, what is my relationship to the technology? Uh, a typical scenario that I unfortunately see a lot, which is uh, boys, uh, again, in middle school and high school age, uh, physically fighting with both their mothers and their fathers, getting physically aggressive, punching, grabbing, hitting, jumping on their backs when the parents attempt to do something that they feel is in the best interest of their son or daughter, which is to disconnect them from the technology. And to encourage people to disconnect from technology, a Brooklyn psychologist created a campaign he called Unplug and Reconnect, a challenge he first tried with his own employees. The challenge was, can you just unplug and reconnect, unplug from technology, reconnect with your friends face to face and yourself and the world around you for one hour? That was a challenge. And it was so successful that we then carried out the challenge to our consultants, hundreds and hundreds of allied healthcare professionals, healthcare and educational professionals, and we were met with such great enthusiasm that we brought out this message to the public. His company runs a website with tips and even contests, promoting, unplugging, and spending more face time with friends and family. We're not anti-technology. It's here to stay. There's so, many, so much good that comes from technology, social media, from all the productivity advances, uh, but we're replacing, unfortunately, a lot of people with computers, and that's not good. Uh, but in general, uh, it is essential that um, we gain control, become masters over the technology, not at the expense of relationships. 
On the other hand, Dr. Fraser emphasizes that just using the Internet or social media doesn't make people automatically addicted. It's not the video games, it's not the Internet, because if it were, we would all be addicted and we all would have a hard time turning it off and saying no. What I've found is that there are uh, children, teenagers, young adults, who I think are at greater risk for uh, having a compulsive relationship with uh, technology. And those are people who are depressed uh, or anxious, who may feel lonely and isolated, and who may be going to these forms of technology as a means of escape. When they do have a hard time turning it off, or when they find themselves obsessively checking or feeling like they need to check, uh, to the detriment of other aspects of their life. What is it about technology and these devices that make people be so connected? I think one of the key turning points was when the technologies became fast enough to allow people to connect uh, from a mobile uh, device, whether it's a, an iPad or whether it's a cell phone, a smartphone, uh, and when video games became uh, online. It used to be that if you played a video game, you played it in your living room and you invited a friend over and you actually had some physical time with another friend in your house and you played the game. And also the games that we tended to play 20, 30 years ago uh, had ends. One of our most important messages, and if this message comes out from this interview, this is an amazing message, is to educate people. We're not going to solve and, and cure an addiction, a technology addiction, with one hour of an exercise, but it's an awareness. The first part of our campaign is to make, help people become aware of their addictive behavior, to know that it's a problem. And then to learn to, you know, we have, a, our motto is unplug from technology, reconnect with people face to face, eyeball to eyeball. And if you're a parent that says, I don't know, anything about computers, you better learn some things about computers. Uh, the second thing is really think about, have a family meeting, talk with other family members about uh, what you think is appropriate in terms of use. You know, at what age do we think it's okay for kids to have cell phones? With what age is it okay for kids to have smartphones? And the experts recommend that adults learn to turn off their cell phones and computers during dinner and to make it a habit to unplug for some time when you get home from work. I am Marlene Peralta for Science and You. I'm Barry Mitchell. Respected scientist Ronald Probstein grew up here in Times Square. But for him, his father and mother, it wasn't bright lights and glamour. Everybody else's father worked at a regular job, brought home a regular amount of money. And my father was a, a gambler and a bookie. We're at the Cafe Edison on West 47th Street, an authentic vestige of 1930s era Times Square, to talk with Ronald Probstein about his memoir, Honest Sid. Dr. Probstein is Ford Professor of Science Emeritus at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He's written many scholarly works, but today, it's all in the family. Honest Sid was my father. He was liked by everyone in Times Square. When you're not living within the law, but just on the edge of it. It's better that you be honest, otherwise you wind up with broken legs. Sid was sure the racetrack would make him rich. He scalped tickets to Broadway shows. And when he gambled away the rent, he sneaked down the fire escape with his wife, Sally, and young Ronald. When you're a five-year-old kid, your mother drags you out in the middle of the night and drags you onto the fire escape. It's a little scary. Did you grow up and become a success? because of or despite your upbringing? That's a very good question. Both my father and my mother, irrespective of what our situation was, were crazy about me. As bad as things were, they always tried to make sure that they, I was taken care of. And Stuyvesant High School took care of nurturing Ronald's love of math and science. And before that, he was inspired by a particular movie. the H.G. Wells, Things to Come. And that dealt with rocketry, going to the moon, building new cities in different planets. I don't even think I knew what being a scientist was. I just said, that's an awful lot of fun to do that. 
And now for the rule of the air and a new life for mankind. What is ballistic missile reentry physics? Well, I work on what was called hypersonic flow. That's the speed of flight or flow at many times the speed of sound. Incorporating principles of hypersonic flow in the design of missiles and spacecraft keeps them from disintegrating upon re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. I, with my colleague, more or less developed the theory of this flow. You wrote the book on synthetic fuels, isn't that true? That is true, yes. Among synthetic fuels, the most important, I believe, will be those that are made and derived from coal. That doesn't mean you're burning dirty coal. The fuels that you get and the process you use in making them can be very clean. The gases that are produced in them are easily captured. The fuel you'll get will be the same fuel that you pump out of your gas station right now. You knew, or at least you met, Albert Einstein. Tell us about that. Every person that I know that it goes into the physical sciences at one time or another becomes fascinated with relativity theory. And I was fascinated with it and I was reading his work and I saw another way of approaching a particular equation. This was an alternative and somewhat simpler approach to the same endpoint. Yours was E equals MC triangle. No, no, it, I don't, didn't tell you that. I, it wasn't that. And so I wrote it up and I went to his house in Princeton. Were you invited? No. You just showed up at his doorstep. Well, I had an, I told him that a friend of mine, who was a friend of his, uh, said I should go. He was a true gentleman, very, very nice, and he took it. Then he told me when to come back, and I came back again. He had looked at it, he said it was fine, it was very good, it was very pleasant to me. And those were my two times of meeting him. How much of your success did Honest Sid live to see? Ah, uh, that was wonderful. He Just... took great pride in your accomplishments. Oh, goodness me. <laughs> it was embarrassing. I mean, sometimes he would exaggerate so much it was terrible. When we were going to get married in 1950, he told all the, the Damon Runyon characters in the Broadway scene here that Einstein was going to be at our wedding. <laughs> I loved him. I was crazy about him. I realized that was his life and I had my life. It's been a real pleasure speaking with you, sir. Dr. Ronald Probstein, the book is Honest Sid, Memoir of a Gambling Man, available at Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com. Thanks for coming down from Boston to speak with us. Thank you for inviting me. You're very welcome, and you are watching Science and You. That's our show for today. Thanks for joining us. I am Marlene Peralta. See you next time on Science and You.